I want to help you understand what an organic chemistry reaction mechanism is and understand all of the picky little details about how they're written. So a lot of times you'll hear the phrase, follow the electrons. And what that's referring to is opposite charges attract. However, the way that, that is written in a reaction mechanism is always electrons from a nucleophile are attacking an electrophile. So let's break down the words nucleophile and electrophile. So the prefix nucleo means nucleus, and the suffix phile means loving. So a nucleophile is something that is nucleus loving. Now, the nucleus of any atom has a positive charge and opposite charges attract, so a nucleophile is going to be something that is negatively charged. In other words, something that is rich in electrons. So it's often going to be a lone pair of electrons or a multiple bond with lots and lots of electrons. Now, the word electrophile, the prefix electro is referring to electrons. So electrophiles are electron-loving. Next, there is a big difference between a chemical equation and a reaction mechanism. A chemical equation gives you the initial reactants, meaning your starting materials, and the final products, meaning the ending materials. This tells you what happened, but it says absolutely nothing about how it happened. A reaction mechanism gives you the how. It goes over step by step by step how a reaction occurred. So I'm going to go through this mechanism and point out all of the picky little details about how it's written. So first, I want to talk about curved arrows. A curved arrow shows electrons attacking. So this is showing electrons from the nucleophile attacking the electrophile. So the tail is always going to be at electrons, so either a lone pair or sometimes multiple bonds, electrons in something that's electron-rich. And the head is going to be pointed at the electrophile. So this hydrogen chloride is polar. The chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so the chlorine is going to have a partial negative charge, hydrogen has a partial positive charge. So this is basically showing opposite charges attracting, but in the form of electrons attacking something with a partial positive charge. Now, this would form a new bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen. That's a problem for the hydrogen because hydrogen can only make one bond at a time. So it is going to give up these two electrons that it's sharing with chlorine. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it's going to take those two electrons. And the way that this is drawn is another curved arrow. So you are seeing these two electrons that were shared going entirely to the chlorine. Let's talk a little bit more about these curved arrows. So it has to be curved to show electrons moving. And if there is only one head, that implies there is only one electron involved in the attack. These were both drawn with two heads. That implies two electrons are involved in the attack. So curved arrows are going to be showing electrons moving. Then we have our reaction arrow, and we write the intermediate products of this very first step. So this oxygen is now bonded to two hydrogens. It has one lone pair of electrons and a positive charge. And the chloride has a negative charge and four lone pairs of electrons on it. Notice that our overall total charge is the same. Here, nothing is charged, so the total charge is zero. Here, we have a plus one charge and a minus one charge. So that's still a sum of zero. Now, the way these mechanisms work is that they generally pick one chemical compound and carry it through the reaction step by step. So I'm going to take this particular product, and it's going to be my reactant in step two. So right now I'm just rewriting that. So oxygen is electronegative, meaning it prefers to have a negative charge. And here it has a positive charge. This oxygen's unhappy. So what's going to happen here is that this oxygen is going to be fighting over these electrons that it's sharing with the carbon, and a lot of times it wins that battle. 
So electrons in this carbon-oxygen bond are going to go entirely to this oxygen. And this molecule breaks apart in the process. So step two, we end up with two different products. We have a carbocation and we have water. In order for this reaction to actually occur, these intermediate products need to be relatively stable, and here they are. Notice that these two arrows are different. Let's talk about the reaction arrows. So the reaction arrows are always drawn with straight lines. And if you see a one directional arrow, that implies that that step is irreversible. So once this occurs, there is no going back. The two directional arrows imply that that step is reversible. There is an equilibrium here. Reaction is occurring in both directions. We can also tell whether this step makes more products or more reactants based on the relative lengths of these lines. So if the line at the top pointing to the products is longer, that means there would be a higher concentration of products than reactants. The other case in which the bottom line pointing at the reactants is longer, that means there would be a higher concentration of reactants. So these are all straight lines. You would see them as your reaction arrow in the middle of these steps. Now, step three, we need to take some of our products from previous steps. Remember, we are just carrying compounds through. It's going to be this carbocation. Remember, we still have a chloride hanging around in solution somewhere. We haven't seen it since step one, but we never got rid of it, so it is still there. And here we have four lone pairs of electrons, a negative charge. We have a carbocation with a positive charge. These electrons are going to attack the positive charge. This is going to be irreversible, and it's going to happen quickly. So I'm writing the word fast above the arrow. And the product that we end up with is this. Overall, the OH group was replaced with a chlorine. But many, many picky details along the way. Now let's talk about the words fast and slow written above these reaction arrows. Those might not always be there, but when they are, there's generally only one slow step. The slow step can also be called the rate determining step. Think of it as a bottleneck. This step is the most difficult to occur. It's the slowest. The rate of the overall reaction is going to be the same as the rate of this slow step. That's why it determines the rate. Reaction mechanisms are powerful. Once you figure out the mechanism through which a specific reaction occurs, you can predict that similar compounds will undergo the same reaction through the same mechanism. A lot of these mechanisms even have names. What I just went through was an example of an SN1 mechanism, standing for unimolecular nucleophilic substitution. Thanks for watching Chemistry in a Nutshell. If you feel that I've earned it, please like this video and subscribe to my channel.